in August of 2009, a 15-year-old girl would leave her home in Antigua, Wisconsin, getting into a vehicle with her friend with plans to spend the night driving around. She would be seen a short time later at a local McDonald's, before allegedly being dropped off at a house 34 miles away. She would never be seen again. This is Midwest Mystery Files, Episode 14, The Disappearance of Kayla Berg. Hello everyone, and welcome to Midwest Mystery Files. I'm your host, Jeremiah, with just a few quick things before we start. Midwest Mystery Files is a bi-weekly, true crime podcast focused on missing and murdered cases within the Midwestern region of the United States. I can be found on all major podcast platforms, as well as on YouTube with delayed episodes. Social media and contact info will be listed at the end of the episode. Now, without further delay, on to today's case. Kayla May Berg was born August 29th, 1993, to Hope Springer and James Spambauer. Kayla was the younger sister to her older brother Jimmy, and the family resided in the town of Antigo in northern Wisconsin. Hope and James never married, but would separate while Kayla was a toddler. Kayla and Jimmy would have the standard arrangement, staying with their father every other weekend. However, it has been noted that Hope would allow the children to see James whenever they wished, and Kayla's relationship with either parent would never falter. It would be shortly after this split that James would become diagnosed with cancer and would have to move back in with his parents. It was through this that Kayla has been noted as becoming a person who would care deeply for those she loved and was always willing to step up and help them. At a young age, Kayla would show interest in gymnastics and would quickly become a skilled gymnast who specialized in tumbling, even joining the high school gymnastics team as a teenager. She's been noted as being a happy and excited girl who was known to pump up the team at every practice. Outside of the gymnastics team, which would have structure and discipline, Kayla's high school hobbies would take a more carefree turn. It's been reported that once entering high school, Kayla's grades began taking a dive, and she was beginning to go out on the weekend more to go partying and drinking. As per the norm for such teenage activities in small-town America, the teenagers of Antigo would begin to grow weary and bored of their hometown, and would begin to travel elsewhere to partake in their activities. Rather than jump one town over, five or ten miles up the highway, Kayla and her friends would begin traveling the 34-mile trip southwest to the town of Wausau. At the population of about five times that of Antigo, Wausau probably seemed like a wild west of endless opportunity for places to party and unwind. In early 2009, during Kayla's sophomore year, Kayla and her friends would begin to party at the Wausau home of Miguel Marrero. Miguel and his brothers were known to hold a lot of parties, and it was through such parties that Miguel and Kayla became acquainted. It would not be long before a romance would form between the two. Despite a slight age difference, with Kayla being 15 and Miguel being 19 years old. It's been noted that the two dated for a bit of time in those early months of 2009, with Miguel driving to Antigua often to pick Kayla up and take her out. However, Kayla's mother, Hope, would strongly disapprove of the age difference and the relationship and would tell Kayla that she needed to call the relationship off, with which Kayla would comply. At the end of Kayla's sophomore year, things were growing harder for Hope. She was having trouble finding work and making ends meet. At the behest of family in Texas, as well as the prospect of more work opportunities, and the thought that a change of scenery would do Kayla some good, Hope decided to move to Texas to get a fresh start. Despite Kayla's troubles, Hope would maintain her stance of openness with her daughter and Kayla's father, James, giving Kayla the option to move to Texas with Hope or stay in Antigua with her father. Kayla, in what I can only imagine was a hard decision, opted to move with her mother to Texas. I want to note that Kayla's brother, Jimmy, had just graduated high school at this point, and there are conflicting accounts as to if he moved to Texas or stayed in Antigua, as this seems to change depending on the source. The stay in Texas would not last long, however, as work would not be as plentiful as Hope had anticipated, 
and Kayla would also be dismayed as she quickly found out the local high school she would be attending had no gymnastics team. The two would also become increasingly homesick, and worst of all, back in Antigua, James, who had still been battling illness, had taken a very drastic turn, becoming very, very sick. After two months in Texas, Kayla and Hope's minds were made up. They wanted to go home. And in early August of 2009, they did just that and returned to Antigua. The quick return would make it difficult for Hope to find a place to live. And as such, she would have to stay with some friends while Kayla would stay with her grandparents. Kayla would waste a little time reconnecting with old friends from both school and Wausau, including her ex-boyfriend, Miguel. It also wasn't long before reuniting with old friends would prove that old habits die hard. On Sunday, August 9th, 2009, word would rise of a big party in Antigua. Most likely being the last big blowout of the summer before school began, Kayla and her friends were ecstatic to attend. To do so, though, a careful plan would have to be concocted. Kayla and her friend Natasha would decide to go with the age-old trick of telling their parents that Kayla is staying at Natasha's house. But as far as Natasha's parents are concerned, Natasha is at Kayla's house. The plan would be set into motion without a hitch. However, the girls may have ended up having a bit too much fun, and while they most likely intended to return home before their parents were none the wiser, they ended up not returning home by the next morning of August 10th, which prompted both of their mothers to become very concerned. And after being unable to contact either young girl, the frightened mothers would end up at the police station, ready to file a missing persons report. The girls would luckily turn up later that day, but as happy a moment as that was, it was also a time for Hope and Kayla to have a mother and daughter heart to heart. While calling, looking around for Kayla, Hope would find out that Kayla had made a habit of going out of town to party in Wausau. Hope would later tell the press this was the first time she had heard of these trips, but that her and Kayla had a thorough conversation, and Kayla agreed that she would stop making the trips to Wausau. We now come to the next day. On August 11th, when the timeline for Kayla's disappearance begins. The day was reported to have started out like any other day. Kayla is reported to have hung out with Natasha in the morning and afternoon, and after spending most of the day out and about, the two girls would return to Natasha's house, where Natasha's older brother, as well as Kayla's older brother, Jimmy, were already hanging out. Also present was 24-year-old Kevin Kilchowski, a friend of Jimmy's who has also been reported as being a close family friend. According to reports, Kevin, despite his age, has been noted as being someone who seemingly hung around Kayla and the other girls, and often acted as their driver to parties both within Antigua as well as Wausau. It would be with Kevin that Kayla would make plans to hang out with later that evening. At some point in the afternoon, or early evening, Kayla would return to her grandparents' house and spend some time with her father before leaving for the night. She would also call her mother, with Hope telling Dateline in 2019, quote, Kayla called that night, August 11th, and said she might go see some friends, but that she'd let me know. Then Kayla said, I love you, and I said, I love you too. Hope would also tell Dateline that Jimmy would note that Kayla also called him that night to see if he wanted to accompany them to a party but Jimmy declined. Phone records indicate Kevin contacted Kayla around 8.45 p.m., and he would arrive to pick up Kayla shortly thereafter. Before leaving, she yelled to her father, who was in another part of the house, that she was going out for the night. Unfortunately, this would be the last time that James would ever get to hear Kayla's voice. The last confirmed sighting of Kayla would come at approximately 9.30 p.m. Kayla's friend Beth, who was working at a local McDonald's, would later tell detectives and Hope that Kayla arrived with Kevin in his Jeep, but Kayla would be the only one to enter the store. It was at this juncture that Kayla informed Beth that her plans for the night were to drive around with Kevin for a little while and smoke some weed. Before leaving, Kayla informed Beth that she would call her once Beth was off work, but unfortunately, Beth would never receive that phone call. Soon, the warm summer night would pass and the morning of Wednesday, August 12th would come. James, upon waking, would find that Kayla had never returned home, most likely figuring that Kayla had pulled a stunt similar to the one she had just pulled the night before. James contacted Kevin to inquire as to if Kayla was still with him 
or if he had any idea where she may be. Kevin would tell James that the two had driven around for a while and he had dropped Kayla off at a friend's house before heading home for the night. Figuring that Kayla would either come home or contact James soon, James would decide to wait it out and wait for Kayla, but a call would never come, and Kayla would never come home. When the evening rolled around, and there was still no sign of Kayla, James contacted Hope to inform her of the situation. Hope didn't answer the initial phone call, and it wasn't until the next morning that she realized she had a missed call in the voicemail. It was James, telling Hope that Kayla had never come home. Hope would call James back, and he would relay the same story to Hope that he had received from Kevin. Hope's next step would be to contact Kevin, but she would be unable to get a hold of him. After that, Hope's next move would be, just as she had done the only days prior, was to start contacting Kayla's friends. She would eventually get to Beth, who would inform her that Kayla had stopped to see her at work, and that Kayla was supposed to call Beth later that night, but she never did. Hope also contacted Miguel Marrero, Kayla's ex-boyfriend, to see if he had any knowledge of her whereabouts. However, he would state that he had last spoken to her at a party the previous Friday, and had not seen or spoken to her since. Panicked, but remembering how the events from a few days earlier turned out, Hope waited to contact police, figuring that maybe Kayla was blowing off steam somewhere or having a fit of teenage rebellion. Then, on August 15th, a ray of hope would shine. Kayla's brother Jimmy would contact Hope and inform her that Kayla was staying with a friend. Jimmy would then provide the friend's name and phone number to Hope. It's unclear where Jimmy got this information. At first, I thought maybe Kayla told him where she planned to stay on the night of the 11th when she spoke to him, but that wouldn't explain why he waited so long to tell Hope. If I had to guess, and I want to stress that word, I would say that Kevin was maybe trying to avoid speaking with Hope and figured he could prolong the confrontation by speaking through Jimmy. Regardless, Hope would attempt to contact Kayla's friend that evening, but would receive no answer. It wouldn't be long, though, before that ray of hope faded out. On the morning of August 16th, the friend that Kayla was supposed to be staying with returned Hope's call. And it was not with news that Hope was looking to hear. The friend had neither seen nor heard from Kayla during the time that she had been missing. With panic going somewhere beyond overdrive, Hope would once again attempt to contact Kevin. Why not initially answering... Kevin did get back to Hope this time around. I want to note that it's at this point that there are some conflicting reports. Some state that Kevin informed Hope that he dropped Kayla off in Wausau at the home of her ex-boyfriend, Miguel. Other reports indicate that he didn't divulge this information until questioned by the police, and he only repeated his story to Hope that he had dropped Kayla off at the home of an unnamed friend. Regardless, at this juncture, Hope decided it was way past waiting for Hope to come home, and on August 17th, 2009, Kayla May Berg would officially be reported missing to the Antigo Police Department. In the first few days, due to previous events and Kayla's friends supposedly proving to be unhelpful, Kayla would be classified as a runaway. After several days, though, her classification would be changed to endangered missing. This most likely had to do with Kevin Kilcheski and his account of the events. Kevin would tell police that he and Kayla drove around for a while, and they had stopped at a McDonald's to see a friend of Kayla's. He would then state he drove Kayla to Wausau and dropped her off at the home of Miguel Marrero at approximately 10.30 p.m. He would go on to tell police that the home was dark, and he wasn't sure if Kayla had gone inside or if someone was waiting for her on the sidewalk. As if he wasn't sure if someone was standing on the sidewalk that he just drove up to, and furthermore, he didn't make sure a 15-year-old girl was safe before speeding off. He then returned to his parents' home in Deerbrook, just to the north of Antigo. This part would be corroborated by his mother. Police would follow up this report from Kevin by speaking with Miguel. It would soon be discovered that the house Kevin allegedly dropped Kayla off at had been condemned, and Miguel was living in a rental a few miles away. Miguel was cooperative with police and allowed them to search both the home and his rental. Both searches would turn up no clues as to Kayla's whereabouts, and Miguel would tell police what he told Hope, that he had not seen or spoken to Kayla since the Friday before her disappearance. While nothing was found inside the house, a search of Miguel's condemned property did bring a hit at a nearby pond, which was subsequently checked by divers. However, no results would be yielded from it. 
A search of both Miguel and Kevin's vehicles would fail to turn up any useful evidence, after which Kevin opted to hire a lawyer and stopped cooperating with police. Cell phone records for both Miguel and Kevin would be checked. Kevin's would confirm that he spoke to Kayla on the phone shortly before picking her up on August 11th, but the phone appeared to have either died or was turned off shortly thereafter. A search of Miguel's phone records would show that Miguel never spoke with Kayla that day. It was found that an old cell phone of Miguel's had pinged off a tower in Lincoln County, about 40 miles north of Wausau, on the night of Kayla's disappearance. Two calls were made, but a search of the area near the cell phone towers uncovered nothing. On October 26, 2009, Kevin was charged with second-degree reckless endangerment in relation to his actions with Kayla on the night she disappeared, specifically the smoking of marijuana while driving around, as well as allegedly leaving her alone in Wausau without verification that she was okay before leaving. He would plead not guilty, and the case would later be dismissed on August 8, 2011, due to a lack of evidence. In December of 2009, Antigo police would ask for assistance from Madison, Wisconsin police officer Carmen Corcoran. Corcoran was known to have a selection of top-tier cadaver dogs who were noted for tracking down unique scents that other dogs may not find. These dogs would be used in another search of Miguel and Kevin's cars. This time, the cars would be added into a lineup with eight other cars for the dogs to sniff. The dogs would get a hit on Kevin's car. This would prompt investigators to check two more properties with the dogs, the home of Kevin's parents, as well as a potato farm that he worked at. The dogs would get a hit at each of these locations as well. Unfortunately, the hits from the dogs would only be considered circumstantial due to the fact that police were unable to prove that the scent belonged to or was connected to Kayla. They would unfortunately need to find more evidence before being able to perform any sort of dig. Moving into 2010, Movements on the case would begin to slow. Investigators would continue to follow up on tips and leads, but would continue to find little to no answers. Soon, 2010 would turn to 2011, with even less answers. As the years carried on, every August would bring a double sting brought on by the anniversary of Kayla's disappearance, as well as another missed birthday for Kayla on the 29th. Then, in 2016, a bizarre and disturbing viral video would be brought to the attention of investigators when it was thought that a girl within the video looked like Kayla. The video, uploaded to the YouTube channel Hi Walter, entitled Hi Walter, It's Me Patrick, is just under a minute long and depicts a young man by the name of Patrick excitedly talking to the camera and telling his friend Walter how he met a girl at the mall that day and spends the next several seconds boasting about how wonderful she is. In the last moments, Patrick becomes even more ecstatic, proclaiming, quote, I know she hates cameras, but I'm going to show you her anyway, before excitedly moving to a door behind him and flinging it open. Behind the door is a bathroom where a young, half-naked woman is bound to the floor by chains. She then screams, Why are you doing this to me? before Patrick slams the door and the video ends. The video was initially uploaded in October 11th, 2009, two months to the day after Kayla disappeared, but was mostly known to those who enjoyed the otter side of the internet. I confess that I myself had seen the video uh, circa 2014 on Reddit. If I recall correctly, it was on the subreddit that was focused on mysterious internet videos. While the ending may be shocking to some, myself and most other people in the thread had all surmised that the buildup in the video was way too obvious, and the acting of the man in the video was way, way over the top and too exaggerated for it to be real. Also, at this point, had never heard of Kayla's case. Regardless, in October of 2016, the video was brought to the attention of the Antigo Police Department once some people began to believe the girl bore a resemblance to Kayla. Not wanting to leave any stone unturned, police did begin to investigate the origin of the video. By only ever seeing photos of Kayla, it's always been hard for me to discern if I think the girl resembles Kayla. But at the time, even Kayla's mother, Hope, was convinced, telling WMMJ-TV, quote, It sounded like her. It looked like her. And that's when my heart just dropped. It's eerie. Very eerie. The resemblance to me. I would never want to see her in that situation, because it's just so sick. 
on October 12, 2016, Antigo Police Chief Eric Roller would take the Facebook and the press and give the following statement. The Antigo Police Department was able to verify that the YouTube.com video, Hi Walter, It's Me Patrick, was a fake video and does not relate to an actual abduction or any illegal activity. The Antigo Police Department was able to make contact with the producer of the short clip and the two actors in the video. We determined that they produced the video as a series of videos and posted this one in October 2009. They did not intend to depict any reference to our missing Kayla Berg. We will continue to investigate all tips and leads we receive regarding our missing Kayla Berg and will do whatever possible to find clues to Kayla's disappearance. Our thoughts and prayers remain with the family and friends of Kayla as they had to endure many different emotions over the last few days as we investigated the source of the video. We appreciate all the cooperation we received from the media and outside sources that assisted us in determining the video origin. It was a double-edged sword for the family. While they now knew that Kayla wasn't being held captive by someone, they still had no idea where she was or what had happened to her. The original video has been taken down in the years since, as well as the channel. However, there are multiple re-uploads to be found if you wish to see it. I will also post a link on social media at some point. Kayla's brother Jimmy would tell USA Today that he had mixed feelings about the video, stating, quote, On one hand, it would have been awful if the woman screaming for help in the video had turned out to be my sister, but if the video were real, at least the police would have a starting point to find Kayla. He would also go on to state that while the experience had been overwhelming for his family, he was happy that there was more attention being brought back to his sister's case. He would also speak on the night Kayla disappeared and how he declined going to a party with her, telling USA Today that he had regretted that decision every day since. The last major bit of movement came in October of 2019. Antigo Police Captain Daniel Dooley would state in a press release that authorities had searched an 11-acre square mile area of Nicolette National Forest in Langlade County, located 46 miles to the northwest of Antigo. Captain Dooley would state in the release that the search was in response to new information that has been gathered throughout the investigation of Kayla's disappearance. He, however, would not state what the information was. Ultimately, no new information or leads would be found in the search, but Captain Dooley would remain undeterred, stating in the press release that Antigua police will continue to tirelessly work on the Kayla Berg case until it is resolved. Kayla's mother, Hope, would remain hopeful as well. In a news story from the Wausau Daily Herald about the search, Hope would state, quote, We still don't know what happened to her, but somebody knows something, and I just wish that person would come forward. I'll never give up. I'll always keep searching. This August will mark 13 years since Kayla Berg disappeared. In that time, there's been searches, strange videos, and a hard determination from the family and investigators to uncover the mystery of what happened that summer night in 2009. We've unfortunately still been left with more questions than answers. That, then, brings us to theories. As everyone has probably guessed, the prevailing theory among almost anyone who is familiar with Kayla's case is that Kevin Kilcheski had something to do with Kayla's disappearance. His behavior from the get-go was suspicious, avoiding hope, not admitting at first where he dropped Kayla off, his cell phone seemingly dying shortly after picking Kayla up, and just being a 24-year-old man who was hanging out with and smoking weed with a girl nine years younger than him. There were also hits from the cadaver dogs on Kevin's car and property he had connection to, and his story about dropping Kayla off at a dark house with seemingly no one around. Some people think Kevin getting a lawyer is also a red flag. However, I don't quite agree with that. If I was a person of interest in a disappearance, and I knew with 100% certainty that I was innocent, I would most likely lawyer up anyway just for that extra layer of insurance. Everything here with Kevin is fairly circumstantial, but I personally think that Kevin's story about taking Kayla to Wausau and his phone being off are the most damning things, if there's anything. You have a guy who's going to be driving all over the place, from Antigo to Wausau and back to Deerbrook, and he in no way thinks that maybe he should have his phone charged? 
While Kevin doesn't particularly scream responsible thinking to me, I know that at that age, I would never let my phone die. Especially if I was going to risk it dying right before I was going to call the girl I was picking up for the evening. In contrast, though, he could have simply turned the phone off because he didn't want his evening to be disturbed. As far as dropping Kayla off, given Kayla's history, it's not unlikely that she would have been looking for a ride to Wausau. However, all reports state Kayla had been talking to Miguel. And according to Miguel himself, he'd seen Kayla the previous Friday. I personally find it hard to believe that Kayla wasn't aware that the house she was being dropped off at was not where Miguel was residing. It's possible, but at the very least you would think that when they arrived and saw the house was dark, Kayla would have at least had Kevin wait until she checked the house before driving off. At the very least, if Kevin isn't responsible for the disappearance, his actions that evening showed a lack of foresight or care for what it might become of Kayla. Looking at the dogs getting hits on the car as well as properties tied to Kevin, this gets a little trickier. It wasn't made clear where the dogs got a hit on the car. If it was just on the general outside, that could have been as simple as Kevin hit a bird and parts of it spent some time in the grill of his car. I don't know if the dogs were trained to find human de decomposition specifically, but December was a lot of time to pass. And given the timeline, I can't imagine that Kevin would have had Kayla in his car post-mortem, if that's what it came to long enough for her to start decomposition. As far as the properties go, the decomposition could belong to anything as well. As far as I can tell, the searches weren't based off tips, but the general hit on Kevin's car, meaning they would need more evidence before proceeding further in the investigation. All in all, there's enough to make Kevin seem responsible on a surface level, but we're a far cry from anything that would implicate him without a shadow of a doubt. You do also have to look at other factors that may have happened that night. Perhaps Kevin did take Kayla to Wausau and dropped her off at the condemned house without a care and left Kayla behind before confirming that anyone was at the house. Or maybe Kayla knew about the house and had plans that she didn't want to involve Kevin in. So she asked to be let out there and then planned to walk to her destination or be picked up by someone else. It is possible that if this was the case, that once Kevin left Kayla, she was met with some sort of foul play. As far as Miguel Marrero is concerned, there's never really been much long-term speculation about him being involved, and it's easy to see why. He was extremely cooperative with police, both his vehicles and home inspections came up with nothing, and his phone records came back showing nothing of alarm. Yeah, he had an older phone that had some pings in the middle of the night, and while that might be worth looking into, there's not much else to go to to make it raise any massive red flags. All in all, with being an ex-boyfriend and his home being the alleged destination of Kayla that night, he is definitely worth looking into. But it doesn't appear that he ever was a strong contender as a full-blown suspect as far as the public knows. One other theory I've seen thrown around is that Kayla was strictly a runaway and her friends covered for her. While it can't be fully ruled out, it seems highly unlikely. In the almost 13 years she has been missing, there's been absolutely zero sign of her, not so much as her social security number being used. Furthermore, Kayla was known to be extremely close to her family, and part of her reasoning for wanting to come back from Texas was the fact that her father was extremely ill. And while this is in no way a judgment of Hope and James' parenting, Kayla did seem to have it pretty easy as far as how often she was allowed to be out and about, even after just giving her parents a big scare. Given all the circumstances, it really seems that Kayla would have had little reason to run away at all. No, I think regardless of who was involved, and while I hope I'm wrong, and I could be, something much more sinister happened that night that was more than just a teenage girl searching for some extra freedom. On a warm summer night of August 11th, 2009, a vibrant, friendly, and fun-loving teenage girl left home in Antigua, Wisconsin to have some fun with a friend. Unfortunately, she never came home. While most people in the true crime community are compassionate and have treated this case with the respect that all missing person cases deserve, regardless of the individual's chosen lifestyle, I have seen a darker underbelly to this case. A small group of the toxic high and mighty sort who prefer to treat this case as a cautionary tale, whether for what they perceive as lax parenting or a young girl that was having too much fun. Some have chosen to villainize the family, and the victim blame Kayla. I bring this up because it is easy to see this as a cautionary tale. Something where parents could tell their rebellious teen, Hey, 
Remember what happened to the bird girl? But it's important to remember that Kayla isn't the center of some scare tactic or a person to victim blame. She was only a victim with someone else to blame for what happened to her. She was a loving daughter, sister, granddaughter, and friend who deserved better than to just disappear off the face of the planet. James Spanbauer would succumb to his illness and unfortunately pass away in 2011, never finding out what happened to his daughter or if she will ever get to come home. The best way to honor his memory and Kayla's memory and to prove that Kayla is more than just a cautionary tale is to continue to share Kayla's story until the day answers are found. She deserves that justice and her family deserves answers. At the time of her disappearance, Kayla May Berg was 5 foot 2 and 108 pounds. Kayla is a Caucasian female with brown hair and brown eyes. Kayla has a scar on her right chin and small chicken pox scars on her right cheek and the right side of her nose. She has abdominal scars from a laparoscopic surgery and her appendix has been removed. Her navel is pierced and her ears are double pierced. Her nickname is KK. She was last seen wearing a red spaghetti strap top a dark blue hooded sweatshirt, blue jeans, tan low-heeled sandals, and a silver ring necklace. If alive today, she would be 28 years old. Age progression photos up to 26 are currently available. I will post those on social media. If you have any information on the disappearance of Kayla May Berg, please contact the Antigo Police Department at 715-627-6411. If you want any more information on the case, there are several podcasts that go in-depth on the case, as well as YouTube videos, and many articles from the Wausau Daily Herald. The television show Disappeared also did an episode on Kayla's case in 2017, entitled The Last Summer. If you wish to let me know what you think happened, have case suggestions or comments, I should note that this case was a listener suggestion, or just want to follow me and the show on social media, I can be found on Instagram at Midwest Mystery Files, Twitter at Files Midwest, and on Facebook by searching for Midwest Mystery Files. You can also email me at Midwest Mystery Files Pod at gmail.com. I do also post photos and sometimes links relevant to each case on social media, mainly on Facebook and Instagram, but I'm going to try and be a little bit more consistent on Twitter as well. Lastly, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, and now Spotify, which just added to this feature, please feel free to rate and review the show. This helps make the show more visible in searches, and more importantly, helps bring attention to the cases I cover. Thank you to all who have done so already. Take care, everyone, and I will see you all in two weeks.